listening to the Kobo Brain Life Podcast, where we bring you insights and inspiration for growing your self-publishing business. I'm your host, Stephanie McGrath. I'm the Publisher Operations Specialist here at Kobo Writing Life. And I'm back. This is Tara Kremen, the Author Experience Manager for Kobo Writing Life. This episode, we're talking to author Nora Dechter. She was actually a winner of the Kobo's Emerging Writer Prize for her title, How Far We Go and How Fast. It was the winner for literary fiction. Yeah, I loved this book, so you got to listen to me be a total fangirl. Um, it's a YA novel that won literary fiction, and uh, we kind of talked to her about her writing process, um, what was involved in it, how she locked herself away in a cabin and wrote for a very long time, and introduced like music that was part of it. And we also hear snippets of her music throughout the episode that was created for the book yeah uh, which is very cool so make sure to listen out for the music yeah and And Nora's super cool it was great to talk to her yeah so here is the interview Again, Nora, thank you so much for joining us on the Kobo Writing Life podcast. It's my pleasure. And so for anyone unfamiliar with you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, well, I'm a, a novelist uh, from Winnipeg. I uh, spent a lot of years in Toronto and a couple years in New York, but recently moved back to Winnipeg full time. Um, and my first novel came out earlier this year. Uh, it's called How Far We Go and How Fast. Uh, your title won the Emerging Writer Prize, Kobo's Emerging Writer Prize. So I guess the question I have is, what pushed you to finish your first novel? Well, um, (laughs) uh, I guess, I mean, a lot of things. I have wanted to be a writer since I was a little kid. And it's been like one of my main life goals, like one of those things that I knew I would regret if I didn't actively pursue it. Um, But finishing a novel is like a real endurance project. I thought it was, I decided to write a a young adult novel and I thought it was something that I could finish in in a summer. I took the summer off to write and it then, and then it took four years. So it's the kind of thing where if I had known it was going to take four years, I would have never started, I don't think. (laughs) Um, So yeah, um, I think what pushed me, I mean, I don't know, some kind of like strange inner drive to do a weird, like solitary thing that in the end, maybe nobody is going to care about. I don't know. Writers are weird. That's kind of freeing. Yeah. See, and was this, um, so uh, sort of give some background about your book. Um, it won the um, literary fiction um, section of the Emerging Writers Prize. And it's a YA novel with uh, uh, a protagonist, Jolene, named after the song. And it's sort of a, uh, like I described it as like teen angst, but like done well without cheese and like super relatable, um, just sort of like teen thing. So I'm just curious, like, was this a story that you had in mind since you were a teenager yourself or was it, did it kind of come to you afterwards? I guess it came to me afterwards. Um, I started writing it when I was about 25 around there. So like uh, coming out of my like delayed adolescence, like starting to, to settle down and um, calm down a little bit. And uh, like I said, I, I started, I decided I was going to write a YA book. I thought it would be easy. Um, <laughs> and yeah, and then I just became like, you know, super invested and really cared about it, really cared about Jolene, my, my main character. And it was, it was a process too. Like at first the story was way different 
Um, but as I wrote, I realized like the parts that I thought were good were the parts that were about music, were the parts that were like super angsty and maybe like written in a more experimental style. And I kind of over the course of many drafts allowed myself to go in that direction more and more. Um, and that's, I think, kind of by letting myself write the kind of writing that I really like to read is kind of what saw me through to the end. Cool. And did um, writing it as a YA book, do you think that that allowed you to be a bit more experimental? In some ways, yeah. I'm still, I still don't know as much about YA as I feel like I should now being a YA writer. Mm -hmm. And um, another thing, like I never thought my book would take me four years to write, but I also never thought I was going to be a YA writer. And now the, the new book that I'm about I don't know, a year and a half into writing is also YA. And I was also kind of resistant to the idea. Um, but that almost intrigues me more, the fact that it's like I'm turning into the kind of writer I didn't expect to be. Um, yeah, I like being surprised like that. Nice. And um, I was reading somewhere where, that you finished the book just in a cabin in the middle of the woods. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Um, so I, I moved away from Winnipeg like, as soon as I could when I turned 18 and ended up in Toronto, which I, I loved, but I, I started spending summers here. Um, after I finished undergrad, I went to York and did uh, a creative writing degree there. Got out of school and had no idea how to um, make money off of writing or even like make enough money doing something else that I could write on the side. Um, but I decided to um, sort of take a chance. I had a bit of student loan money left and I sublet my apartment in Toronto and went back home um, to Manitoba where my family has a cottage that is, um, it's like the old family cottage, but it's very much, my family's super scattered around North America and the world, and nobody really uses it anymore. So I decided, you know, I was asking myself, like, how do I keep writing? I was really anxious about whether or not I would maintain a writing practice when I wasn't in a school program that was setting deadlines for me. Um, but I, yeah, I sort of packed my bags and went to West Hawk Lake, Manitoba, and spent, I think the first summer I was there for three months. And at first I had no internet and no cell phone and no car too. So I'd get dropped off there by one of my very kind parents with a couple of weeks worth of groceries and uh, yeah, settled in. And, and uh, it took me, I guess I was there for three summers working on this. Wow. wow. Were you there alone? I was, yeah. And that was uh, another... It was a very instructive experience. Um, as I much bet. as I've been trying to be a writer for a really long time, I, I wasn't necessarily very disciplined. Um, so taking, I guess maybe I'm a little bit of an extreme person, but I was like, I'm going to take myself out of the city and outside of, like away from outside influences. And I, I didn't know what I was doing. And I was totally conscious of the fact that um, my parents might think I was like a crazy loser like their, their strange 25 year old daughter who's staying at the cottage in the woods by herself. Um, I wonder if they just like drove up there sometimes to just check in on you <laughs> yeah, without really. telling you <laughs> they just like, can drive around again. My dad was very concerned. He's like a protective father and gave me a weapon to keep in every wow. room of the cottage. Every Not done. But, oh, okay. Yeah. But like a hammer and like a pry bar and some bear spray and various knives and, um, <laughs> And I had no idea if I'd be able to do it. I thought I'd be super spooked. I'm like a real uh, chicken about things like mice and stuff like that. And, um, but no, I really like, I don't focus like this anymore, but I got into the habit of like, I wrote from like six, seven, eight hours a day. Wow. But I, I think it, I really, I got better quickly during that. And it was always on this one story. Like, did you ever want to just like write something different? Cause you're just like tired of trying to finish something. Yeah, um, I guess like, I mean, yes, but then on the flip side, I think I do have a lot of like um, staying power with projects, mm -hmm. almost to a fault. Like it would have been smarter for my career to have been writing shorter things while in those four years while I was working on my novel and getting published and building credits. Um, it's really hard to get people to take you seriously when you say you're a writer, but you've never published anything. Mm -hmm. But I'm just, I'm, I write long things. I, I am not a short story writer, nor am I much of a journalist. I just like making things up too much. Um, so yeah, so I think that was one of the things that allowed me to like stick with it. Uh, the fact that I suck at writing short things. <laughs> I, I'm glad you did. Um, I was one of the judges for the Emerging Writers Prize and uh, I loved this book. I like 
couldn't put it down and I think like tried to have one sitting where I just like read the whole thing and it made me cry a bunch of times and I usually don't cry at books only when I'm on like airplanes I don't know (laughs) on airplanes there's some science that you cry on planes more than oh that makes sense to me (laughs) um but I was in my apartment weeping at this point (laughs) Um, it was really great in a good way I was just like oh it's so cathartic but um but I really liked that um the music was such a sort of integral aspect to um Jolene's identity and like uh maybe I was crying because I can still relate I can still feel like my teenage yeah. self sometimes and you're just like oh mm-hmm. god it's so cringe so I was really stoked when I was uh, I was googling you afterwards like totally being a creep and um hmm. I found the songs that you um made that so I loved that that like Jolene's like listening to this music and then you can find it online and actually listen to it afterwards. So did you have that uh, like were the songs in mind first or did they come after the book or what was sort of the process with um, writing the music? Um, I think it happened sort of simultaneously. Um, I started, I mean, I have the same experience being like a like a huge music fan as a teenager and like nobody understood me, but my idols in in rock and roll. (laughs) Um, And I'm still kind of like that too. And I know a lot of people like that. So I think that was a motivating factor. Like I thought that people like my friends would like to read this book. Um, But I've been playing in bands since high school. Um, I don't play any instruments as much as I have occasionally tried. Um, I just, I would, I sang in a band and wrote lyrics Um, but always found, like, I always thought of myself as, like, I'm really a writer who just, you know, sometimes, like, writes songs and sings. Um, I was still, but I was still more active in music when I started writing the book, and yeah, songs, song, I was writing songs that borrowed some lines from the book, and then the book borrowed some lines from the songs, and I was kind of nervous. I wasn't sure if that was, like, allowed, like, if I was, like, plagiarizing myself, but then I realized, like, I mean, you if you're not a journalist, you can fully plagiarize yourself as much as you like. And yeah, I mean, uh, unless you plan on suing yourself, I think it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I came up with the idea that, yeah, that these were, these are the songs written in Jolene's voice and that it could be a nice like companion piece. And I kind of like that. It's like, I mean, it's not hidden away on my website, but it is the kind of thing that like, if you love the book and you want more after you can go looking online and find this new little, like new little nugget of, of story. Yeah, that was exactly it. It felt like a little Easter egg afterwards because mm-hmm. you're kind of a, it's sort of a book that you put down and it just sort of stays with you for a little while. And then finding the song sort of like helped you ease out of the sort of like, I love finding uh, stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. um, so you're not going to pursue a further musical career? Are you just going to go full blown writer? You know, since I've gotten older and slightly less angsty, I, I find <laughs> uh, I don't write as many songs, which makes <laughs> bit sad but then I wonder if like maybe all my creativity is just being channeled into writing novels now um also like I'm happy to be more well adjusted than I was in my late teens and early 20s um (laughs) good good to be aware of the growth that's good (laughs) it's true yeah and music is I mean music will always be a big part of my creative process but it's not the focus of my next book so I mean we'll see I certainly hope that I don't that I you know my songwriting days aren't behind me but uh it was never really what I was truly good at, I don't think. I mean, I think the songs are great, but... Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, did you find it was harder writing the songs or writing the novel? Definitely the novel. Songs are so much more immediate. Yeah. Um, and I collaborate with the songs, too. Like I said, I don't play instruments. So um, for the EP, uh, the book EP, I collaborated with um, like my partner in life, Nick. Um, so he wrote all the music, and he is really good at... We actually wrote it and recorded the EP before we were actually dating. Um, but he's really good at like understanding uh, like the tone I'm going for in a song and then translating that into sound, which is kind of like the opposite process that I've always tried to do. Like I'm like a huge, not that I like, like emo music, but I am an emo person. And when I listen to music, I feel a lot. And I've always wanted to create that same sort of like surge of feeling and emotion reading like words on a page. And had he read the book before doing the music or was it just that you explained what you were looking for? He hadn't read it, no. Um, so he just, I guess I, when in the early stages of our courtship, we'd like walk around Toronto at night and I would like tell him the whole story, which was like an early indication of us being good partners because I don't do that with everyone. Um, but yeah, so he just like, he knew what I told him and he knew like what story was in the songs. So you mentioned the... Um that you don't consider yourself a YA author necessarily, or you didn't think you would be. 
Mm -hmm. were there any YA novels that inspired you or that you read when you were a teen that you're like, this is amazing? Yeah. I mean, a handful of them. I was like, I was a pretty precocious reader and I, but I also read like wildly or widely or both um, Mm -hmm. as a young person. So like I was reading beyond sort of my age category and then also reading things uh, they were geared towards me. My dad's a bit of a literary snob, even though he dropped out of school in grade nine and he would like get mad. He'd take me to the bookstore and like buy me books and fully supported me wanting to be a writer. But, uh, it, he didn't like me reading smut. So like no sweet Valley and babysitters club. I'd have to read those in secret. Um, I really loved the book, um, speak when I was growing up the YA book, mm-hmm. uh, the author of which escapes me right now, but it's, um, like a super emotional story about a girl who has been sexually assaulted, um, and in similar, I think that inspired me a bit in that she's like writing around her trauma for a lot of the book mm-hmm. and you slowly learn what's happened. Um, I loved Catcher in the Rye. Sometimes I think of my book as like my Winnipeg girl version of Catcher in the Rye. <laughs> I literally um, have Catcher in the Rye written in my notes here to talk to you about. And I was like, that's, <laughs> oh, it. Nice. that's what it felt like to me <laughs> yeah. as well. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, what else? I love uh, Miriam Taves, who's not a YA writer, but is a Manitoban writer. And her big breakout book was Complicated Kindness. And it, oh, right. uh, again, it's a book about a teenager, but it's not published as YA. But um, I was super inspired by that, like a, a very disaffected young female voice, uh, miserable in Manitoba. Um, are you not miserable in Manitoba now that you've moved back? <laughs> No, it's weird. I walk around being like, is it okay that I live in Winnipeg again? I think it is. Um, (laughs) Yeah, we, I mean, life is a lot easier here. Was it inspired by the book? You're just like writing about Manitoba for such a long time. You're like, I'm just going to go live there again. No, it was another one of those life like twists and turns that I wasn't expecting. Uh, Nick, my partner, said that, you know, he was fully expecting that we would move to Manitoba one day. And I, I would have sworn until it happened that we would never, <laughs> I, I kept getting work here. So I'm, I'm teaching university courses that I was teaching at a couple different schools in Manitoba. And I just I kept going back and forth. I do like a three or four month contract and go back to Toronto and then come back here. Um, and really just like we started to want to have a nicer apartment and uh, that's way easier here. So I have my own office sure now. Is. <laughs> nice high ceilings and a lot of light. Oh. And, yeah, <laughs> jealous. <laughs> Toronto yeah. does not have that. <laughs> no, and I think it's like a something I had to accept that as a writer I need to live somewhere that's a bit more affordable. I made it. I made it work in Toronto for a long time, but long term, uh, yeah, I just need more space and quiet. And yeah, you're closer to that cabin. You can just go mm-hmm. there. Um, so I guess we want to ask you sort of a, I guess, semi serious question now. Uh, not that the others weren't serious, but. We're very professional interviewers. Um, <laughs> what motivates you professionally and personally? Um, I mean, nothing ever matches the feeling that I feel when I've written something that I think is good. Like for my whole life, if I write a line that like I think kind of hits the truth on the on the nail or whatever, um, it makes me feel really good. Kind of makes me feel like better than any other feeling in life. So. Uh, like I was saying earlier, like the the fear, I guess I'm motivated by like fear, <laughs> anxiety, um, but the fear of never writing a book really motivated me to write a book. Um, and then of course, as soon as my book came out, there was the fear of never writing another book. And then that spurred me on. Um, yeah, I, I think that like expressing a, a feeling about being human or about life, as corny as it sounds, that like might resonate with another person is um like really uh validating and gratifying and something that I wanted to chase um so can you talk to us a little bit about the Emerging Writers Prize experience um did you know that your book was being entered or did the publishers do that themselves um when did you kind of learn about it and like what was it like coming back to Toronto for for kind of such a different reason um, yeah, well, it was a, a wonderful and super exciting experience. Um, I knew that my publisher had submitted me, but I wasn't expecting to get that email when I got it. I was actually having like a particularly mopey day feeling like, like literally I was walking around feeling like, I think I might've kind of squandered the publication of my first book. Like I didn't, um, do enough to promote it. I was starting a new job kind of right around when it came out and I was so stressed out by that like designing curriculum for a bunch of university courses from scratch that I felt like I didn't have the time and energy to put towards 
self-promotion. I also suck at self-promotion. So I was just kind of like having a mopey day when I got the email saying I'd been nominated and I was so thrilled. I think um, even just getting shortlisted for an award can be like such a huge boost for authors in terms of, um, you know, uh, putting a little shine on your name and getting your book out there. And I was, I was just so happy that, um, happy for my book that it was going to get another push out into the world. Um, and then didn't expect to win at all. It's one of six nominees. And I really kind of felt like I was the underdog with my book being a YA book nominated in the literary fiction category and being, I mean, there's, I really admire like the mix of types of books and, uh, you know, levels of publishers that were nominated for the prize. Um, it was a lot of strong books this year. Like, I mean, they're always strong, but this year in particular for me, like I was like, found so many new favorites when I was reading them I was like I just want everyone to win oh that's amazing um yeah I was only really familiar with Tanya Tagak's book of the nominees but now I'm working my way through reading all of them but I was uh blown away to be on the same list and so excited for what it meant for like my book getting out there more um and you know making the road to publication in the future a little bit easier because I, I have kind of done it well with lots of help from teachers and people along the way but like I don't have an agent I just when I was submitting my book, I just sent it to every publisher in Canada that was taking unsolicited submissions and saw it, like, waited to see what happened. Um, so going back to Toronto, uh, we were very excited to have the excuse to go back. We've been in Winnipeg for, uh, I guess, like full-time, the two of us for six months, and we're kind of going to wait for a couple more months before we went to visit. So we were super excited to go back. And uh, yeah, it was amazing. I am, I'm not used to... Uh, like, I don't know, leaving my writing cave and hobnobbing with other writers and like meeting people. And I have to say, I really admire how unsnobby Kobo is in terms of like, I think it's wonderful that the there's the rotating genre category. It was romance this year. Um, like I said, I was so delighted to have my book considered literary fiction too, because um, I think just because it's about a teenager doesn't mean it's only going to be interesting to teen readers or that it doesn't count as literary too. Um, so yeah, overall, it's been pretty dreamy. I still like wake up in the morning and I'm like, I won. <laughs> That's awesome. And you mentioned in your speech, Tara was saying about the age. Yeah, that a lot of the um, nominees and winners were sort of older, well, not older, but they weren't like fresh, fresh out of school and writing their first novel, which is sort of nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I admire people who can write great novels at 23, but mm -hmm. I certainly couldn't. So... I think it's really nice to not have those cut off, cut off times of like, thir you know, yeah. under 30 or under 35 or whatever. Um, yeah. When I was chatting to um, a lot of the romance authors that were there, the nominees, um, I loved the difference of like, I was like, oh, so how long were you writing this book for? And one of them was writing the book for 20 years. And Whoa. then the other one was like, oh, I wrote it last year. Like, and they're both nominated. So yeah, it's always a great, um, I love hearing authors' different stories. Like yeah, that. it's really interesting. Some people work so fast. I have writer friends who can just like sit down and write a beautiful story. And I can sit down and write like, you know, a bunch of pages of crap and then sift through it and one day make it good. But um, no, I'm not a fast writer by any means. Um, so what's next for you? You were talking about that you're doing another YA book. Is it um, related at all or is it just a separate standalone? It's, uh, I guess it's unrelated. Um, and yeah, I, I, I had been working on a novel for like off and on for two years, kind of like while I was editing this one. Um, and I wanted it to be, my intentions were that it was going to be um, a serious literary book with a male third person protagonist. Um, and I, yeah, like I said, I, I think I wrote like, I was just looking at my first draft. I think I wrote almost 300 pages of this book before deciding that I didn't feel anything for it and it sucked. Oh, wow. And um, <laughs> I don't know. I had been the way I was trying to I've never really written very many male characters and I wasn't sure that I could. I also was like, I don't even know. I'm way more interested in like female voices and, and male voices. Um, but I was like, I'm going to try and get into this like male main character by being really interested in all of the women who are around him. And then eventually one of those women just became the protagonist of the book. So um, for the last about a year, so all told I've been like, working on this on and off for like two or three years but the last year I've been rewriting it as a YA book with a first person angsty female teenage narrator <laughs> um, yeah and so again I had to give myself permission to like write what I really wanted to write 
and I, like I said, I like surprising myself. I like that I thought I was going to do this like literary, like great Canadian novel, and instead I'm writing another like first person Manitoba. <laughs> yeah. Gotta write, write what you know, isn't that what they say? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I always think like I tell my students to look at what they're obsessed with, even if it's like video games or like. I don't know, movies or celebrities or something and like draw from that. Cause if you're passionate about it, it'll come through. And then my next question was, do you have any advice? But that might be the advice. Yeah, I think, I think that is my main advice. Like uh, don't try and write what you think you're, you should or what will get published or be noteworthy and just write what like you think is great. Nice. Good advice. That's awesome. Well, thanks so much for um, chatting with us. That was really oh, great. It's yeah. been a pleasure. Thank you. I'm sorry I made you cry. <laughs> it was okay. She loved it. <laughs> what did she say? <laughs> Just a satisfactory weep, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. Feels good sometimes. Every once in a while when I was writing the book, and this is a bit embarrassing, but I would move myself to tears, and then I was like, this is embarrassing, but I also think it means I'm onto something. I feel like that's a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> that's nice. Making yourself cry in a yeah. roundabout way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so great as, as, as tears are falling. <laughs> yeah, that's why I go to the cabin by myself to work. Oh, it, it all makes sense it. now. It it's coming full circle. Hide it. <laughs> Thank you, Nora. Oh, it was nice talking to you guys. No one for days. This is an old. So I can't stay. Thank you for listening to the Kobo Writing Life podcast. Um, if you're looking to listen to um, Nora's full album of music, you can find um, the band Proofs on her website at noradexter.com. If you're looking to enter the Emerging Writer Prize next year, are you Canadian? Maybe you're finishing your first book. Um, keep an eye on Kobo's social and Kobo Writing Life social, and we'll have announcements later in the year. Um, or if you just want tips on how to finish your first novel, um, visit kobowritinglife.com. This episode was produced by Tara Kremen. Music was provided by Tearjerker and Proofs. This episode was edited by Stephanie McGrath, and special thanks to Nora for being a guest on our podcast. If you're ready to start your self-publishing journey today, sign up for free at kobo.com slash writing life. Until next time, happy, happy writing. Happy writing.